Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Senator's Roundtable. I'm your host, Jacob Billington, joined by Dayton Reimer and Paul Quinney, who still got his feet in the sand in Mexico. Um, it's a tough time watching Ottawa. I'm going to be honest with you. Before I even ask you how you're doing, I'm just going to tell you how I'm doing. And I'm getting sick of watching a losing product. Um, it's it's getting really frustrating. It's I, I was on board for... Like, let's finish out the season. I don't expect playoffs, whatever. See some positivity. I'm getting sick of watching the Ottawa Senators. Yeah, they're tough to watch. I mean, uh, okay, they lost tonight fair and square to the Bruins uh, 6-2, but the the galling thing was them going down to the Carolina Hurricanes uh, 7-2. They lost it in the third. I mean, that's nothing short of a disgrace. I don't think that's too much of an exaggeration. Yeah, that's two games in a row um, against Boston and Carolina, who 100% should be beating the Senators. There's, I don't expect wins out of those games, but it was 3-2 to two going into the third period both games, and they were outscored 7 nothing in the third period between the two. Well, if we're just jumping into it here. Um, I think we have our answer, essentially, for what to do, right? Um, it's clearer than it ever has been before that Pierre Dorian set up this team to fail and now it is failing. Yeah. And sure, lots of young guys and lots of, you know, potential talent. And there was some pretty good trades and some of the signings were promising. Yeah. But the fact that he mortgaged the future before having any success and there's a guy on the hockey writers who comments on, I think, probably every every senator's article, but I see him always on mine. He repeatedly says, why does this team have no first round draft picks and seven years of no playoffs? Those two shouldn't be in hand. So I think I think this is a failed experiment and you retool, not a rebuild. I, I think the answer is retool. This is like you can't keep doing this right but does does this core have it i mean uh you know did, i hate to say did, did you just blow this team up and start over i don't know that the core has it i think you start over in a sense of steve steos now has the opportunity to build his own team i don't think yeah. you start over by trading drake batherson tim stutzel thomas shabbat jake sanderson for draft picks that i don't want to see that kind of start over but you just need to redo everything you kind of need the the lateral passes the lateral trades um you don't necessarily need to win or lose these trades just make things different that's what this team needs different yeah like taking a, a um oh i had the word and it's gone a page from the vancouver canucks <clears throat> our, our uh editor will be yeah. i think happy to, to hear that um but they seem to have kind of figured it out um are they one of the best teams in the league? No. There's some obvious holes and flaws that they still have to get through. But they were one of the top teams this year, and they're going into the playoffs in a very strong position because they never committed to a rebuild. At times, that was a mistake. But it's got them here, so maybe not that big of a mistake as we all assumed. So comparing that to the Senators, I think Ottawa needs to, and Steos take a look at their team and flip out the guys that aren't working for similar guys that do. So it's not so much a strip down draft picks like it was when Carlson left, because that was a big thing. You kind of had to do that. Right. But uh, with the, the amount of talent that is there, I think they just need different support and you got to figure out how to get out of those no movement trade clauses. And you have to figure out how to get, some better depth and better results from your top six. And I think that just needs different guys because there's, there's, there's a ton of skill. There's a reason that they were a fringe playoff team at the beginning of the season. There's skill there. Stutzla has the skill to be a top NHL player. Kachuk has the potential to be one of the best leaders in, you know, at least in the, in the conference. Uh, Jake Sanderson has the potential. Thomas Shabbat still has the potential to be excellent players. They just haven't been. And you need to figure out how to 
build around that better. But let me, let me ask you this then, Dave. Do, do you think these senators can uh, trade for what they need or do they need, need to develop the talent, draft it and develop it? And the reason I'm asking that is I remember Daryl Sutter saying one time of Calgary, he said, look, nobody wants to come to Calgary. So we're not going to trade for big stars. We're a Canadian franchise, and therefore we're going to have to draft well and uh, develop our players. And uh, is is that the way forward for for Ottawa? I'd be curious when he said that, whether it was, that was the first time or the second or the third. How many times has he been there? Okay. No, he said it in <laughs> uh, during my tenure with the uh, – with the hockey writers. So within the last four years. So, okay. Yeah. But you know, to your point on, on no trade clauses, I don't know that you can avoid them. So if you can't avoid them, uh, I mean, Ottawa's not on the top of anyone's destination list. Let's be honest. Uh, so that forces you into uh, developing your players. And which, you know, a lot of people argue Ottawa has not done very well. No, no. The, uh, the farm system hasn't supported the team super well. But I think that's also kind of coming into it with deficit thinking. Like, mm. sure, people don't want to come to a losing team. But if it wins, people are going to want to come. Oh, it's Canada. People don't want to come. If they're winning and it's a good culture and, you know, they have the proof that it's possible, people are going to mm. want to come. People like Kachuk. People like playing with him. He's got a lot of friends. Josh Norris wants to play there. Um, there were some other guys that uh, they brought in that were, were close with him in, in previous teams. Also working with Thomas Shabbat, right? That's why Matthew Joseph is there. They were teammates in Cape Breton, I think. Yeah. Was that the team? Uh, yeah. No, it was... Um, it was a Q St. team. St. John. St. John's. St. John's. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Um, so, yeah, relying on those past you know, friendships, past chemistry. I think that's going to work. Um, yeah, using the connections that are already there, I wouldn't go overboard because then you get a reputa reputation like Kyle Dubas where he only gets Sue Greyhounds. <laughs> but yeah, I don't know. I, I think I think people will come, you know. Yeah. It's a it's field of dreams. If you build it, they'll come. I don't have the exact number of players in the NHL with no trade clauses. Do you know how many players in the NBA have a no trade clause? No, tell me. Ten, ever. Ten? Ten. Wow. It It's insane that the NHL has normalized no trade clauses. And I don't expect that there's going to be a huge difference for long between the NBA and the NHL. So is the NHL going to step away from no trade clauses or is the NBA going to step up with them? I don't know. But like some of the names on this list, I just brought it up. Um, Kobe Bryant, Tim Duncan, Kevin Garnett, Carmelo Anthony, Dwayne Wade, LeBron James, and a couple other guys I haven't heard about as a not even casual basketball fan. But like these are the guys that's like saying, uh, Sidney Crosby, Alex Ovechkin, um, Connor McDavid, Connor Bedard, right? It, these guys, they just don't hand out no trade clauses. And mind you, the contracts are a lot shorter. They're only um, three or four years max. And I don't know. I think the NHL should start working their way towards that. It's unfortunate to see guys like Brady Kachuk not extended for eight years. But I don't know. I, I like the way that contracts work in the NBA. and. Part of it might be that the NBA doesn't have a lot of Canadian teams that players don't want to go to. That's just reality. Uh, but back to kind of the main point you were talking about, Ottawa can be a destination players want to go to. I mean, there's always going to be players that don't want, um, that have an eight-team no-trade clause, and it's the seven Canadian teams in Buffalo, the the American Canada. Uh, but there's there's always going to be those players. They can be a destination players want to go to. Uh, do you want to yeah. guess on how many players in the NHL? I found it. I, I pulled it up here. How many players are under contract? Does it say there? So I have it just for this season. Yeah. So in this season, who has a current 
no movement or a no trade or a modified no trade or no movement. So I'm going to say there's about 600 NHL players under contract. There's lots of minor leaguers, but I'm going to say my guess is going to be 220. Did you want to take a guess, Paul? 120. Okay, Jacob, you're very close. 245. Oh, so close. Yeah. And you know what? I almost changed to 185. That was my second guess. Um, but yeah, yeah that's that's insane. And like, why does Travis wow. Hamannick have a no move clause? That's not affecting anything tonight. That's not what we're here to talk about tonight. But why does Travis Hamannick have a full no move clause? And yet you only see LeBron James and Dwayne Wade and Tim Duncan and Kobe Bryant having no trade clauses. There. Like that is foolish. Yeah. Lucic but, also has a no move clause, full no move. Yeah, that's ridiculous. Why? Yeah. <laughs> Stop. It's, I don't know. It's I I don't, don't think we need to go full basketball, full NBA here, but <laughs> 245 out of 600. That's like one every 3. Is that not? Yeah. Yeah, about that's... that. And that's kind of where I was going with that. There's like six to eight players on most teams that are going to have a no trade or no move or modified or some sort of stipulation on their contract. Like, that's insane. But my, my understanding is that the uh, NHL Players Association is quite attached to no trade clauses. So you've got to, you've got to renegotiate the CBA. Right. Uh, yeah. But. Well, I'm you... not against having them. I think having them is a good idea to give a little bit more stability. I just don't think you have to give one to everybody. Yeah. And like, let's, you you don't have to renegotiate the CBA. General managers can just stop giving them out. Yeah. Like all 32 general managers can show up at the general, at the GM meeting today and say, all right, guys, we're done with the clauses. Nobody's giving one out anymore. But you know, I, like you, I was a bit gobsmacked when you said Lucic has one. I mean, you think any any general manager would say, "Look, Milan, <laughs> uh, yeah, no, you're not getting one." I mean, it's not as if he's in a bargaining position of any. Uh, yeah, here. I'd give him one over Hamannik. <laughs> if I'm going to be completely honest, I'd give Lucic a no move clause over Travis Hamannik. Yeah. Um. Yeah, we, we could talk about the CBA and all these rules and no trade clauses for hours, I'm sure. Um, but let's jump into actual senator stuff for a little bit. Um, seeing as this is the senator's roundtable. <laughs> um, I think it's time to revisit the Jacob Chicker and Thomas Shabbat debate. I know, Paul, you wrote about this not long ago. Um, Dayton, you've shared some thoughts on it. I have a couple stats that I want to share with you before I ask your question uh, or ask you the question. Um, Jacob Chikrin under DJ Smith, 25 games played, five goals, 16 assists, 21 points. So 21 points in 25 games and was a plus two. In 41 games under Jacques Martin, four goals, seven assists, 11 points, minus 20. Is it time to apologize to DJ Smith? Not really, but like that that's terrible. Yeah. And over oh, the past yeah. and over the past 31 games, Jacob Chikrin has one more point than Nikita Zaitsev. <laughs> and Nikita Zaitsev is even. Jacob Chikrin is minus 20. So I'm I'm guessing he's not thriving under Martin's uh defensive oriented systems not at all but and then you look at thomas shabbat coming back um and he's got five goals in his 10 games in his last 10 games stretching to before his injury but five goals in his last 10 games he's looked really really good he's had a ton of speed um and it's time to apologize to thomas shabbat like where where do you guys sit on this right now i'll start with you on this paul Okay, so that's interesting. The slant I took in the article that I wrote a couple of weeks ago was, um, you know, a good thing that uh, Stavis didn't trade them. They didn't, you know, rush forward uh, and make a bad trade. But uh, <clears throat> the, those stats, because if you look at his season overall, you could be fooled uh, into thinking that he's a real offensive power, right? He was, I think, number six in terms as a points getter, uh, lead 
on the season leads uh, all defensemen in uh, points, goals. Uh, his average time on, on ice uh, was essentially equal to Sanderson and Shabbat. His hits were uh, just second to Hamannick. Uh, block shots. I think he leads the defense core. So I would have said, no, the guy's good value. He was, the perception was when he came in, it was a good value and contract and it still is. But um, that stat you pointed out there, Jacob, uh, that's, that's sobering. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, under Jacques Martin, he's on pace for 22 points and minus 40 on the season. Minus 40. I don't, well, yeah. Last I looked, he was minus 17, but but, but well, as you bring right. out, the, extend the uh, what he's doing now under Martin, it would be minus yeah. four. Exactly half a season, 41 games, and he's a minus 20 in those 41 games under Martin. Yeah. Okay. Now I'm in a, now I take back everything I said in that article, trade him. <laughs> Dayton, you got some thoughts on that? Um. Yeah, kind of sorting through them here. Uh, so just checking the, the defensive pairing stats you know, on Money Puck. For the game tonight. And the most effective defensive pairing was Shabbat and Chikrin, believe it or not. So they had a 0.57 goals for, a 0.07 goals against, expected, sorry. Um, so they had, yeah, I mean, they were only together for two minutes. <laughs> right. That's what I was just going to check because, yes. yeah, they weren't together very much, but they were pretty good when they were. And maybe that's because it was. In a small dose. Second best was Sanderson Zub. I mean, that's not a surprise. Uh, the worst defensive pairing tonight, who were on the ice for 15 minutes, was Chikrin Bernard Docker. Yep. Um, the second worst, skipping over Sanderson Shabbat, which uh, only was on there for less than a minute, was Shabbat and Brandstrom. So... The two guys are are, are pretty close. <laughs> yeah. Um, huh. Who would I, I'll, I rather keep? I'll say based on the eye test, I really liked Shabbat Brandstrom tonight. I didn't look at their money puck advanced stats and whatnot, um, but I did really like Shabbat Brandstrom. But Chikrin Bernard Docker got exposed quite a few times. Chikrin did not look good tonight. Yeah. How did Bernard Docker look beside him? Uh, he looked okay. He made some silly passes and... Um, it could have been better, but I mean, he's Bernard Docker. The sky isn't, or the limit isn't sky high for him. Um, he, he, he played a Jacob Bernard Docker game. Yeah. He's a guy that you want on your third pairing. Yeah. Maybe your second pairing if you have some injuries, but he's, he's always was going to be a third pairing guy. Even when he was drafted in the first round. I don't think that's a, a bold take or anything like that. Um, man, I feel safer with Shabbat. Yeah, I agree. I think Chikrin was a good pickup that hasn't worked out as well as it could have. Because I think, at least right now, in the last two seasons, players have come into Ottawa and they have not been put into a position to succeed. And I don't have any firm stats behind that. It's mainly based on gut and vibe so take this as you will but uh, you keep having guys sign in here who don't have a lot of success and just want to leave but they have I mean they were given the world in these contracts so that they could pick where they wanted to go and the senators get nothing for them yeah. so a new guy comes in and is put in a different position but they don't have the right... I don't know. Whatever's being used isn't working, and it's work. It's not working for literally everyone. And I don't know what to do with that. All I can say is that Chikrin has a lot more giveaways, at least last I looked. Yeah. And I don't like that. And he's easier to move, so... Maybe maybe that's what you just kind of have to evaluate in the offseason. He can be moved. Shabbat can't really be moved. And maybe you could get more for Shabbat. 
but you, you I, something needs to change. So something needs to change, but I want to throw in the fact that I think trading Jacob Chikrin this offseason is going to be a mistake. Right now, his value is probably as low as it's ever been, if I'm going to be honest, just because of how the second half of the season has gone for him. Um, teams are going to see that. They're going to say, listen, like he underperformed significantly. Well, I'm not going to pay top dollar for him right now. Uh, why would I? He's just he scored 11 points in the last 41 games. I'm not doing that. And, and he hasn't been great defensively. That's the biggest thing. You can slow down on your production as long as you're excellent defensively. He's not providing much of anything right now. And that's really, really frustrating after giving up a first and two seconds. I don't know. You're not going to get that back with the way he's been playing right now, especially 12th overall pick was it was you're not getting that back right now. So I think that you hold on to him, hope for a coach that he fits better under next year, because it's not going to be Jacques Martin next year. Um, See if it's whoever it's going to be. Claude Julien, Craig Berube, Chris Kelly, whoever's coming in. Um I hope he does better under them. Trade him at the deadline. Yeah, no, you're, I think you're right. I just see a real problem, at least by as early as next season, with the left side of the defense. Because you have Sanderson there, who's not going anywhere. Shabbat, who can't really be moved. And Chikrin, who has no value. Or lower value. He's still a 30-point defenseman. He still has a lot of value, but yes, just not, uh, not his peak. No. And then I think, well, you also got Brandstrom down there, who's likely not coming back. You've got, who else is on the left side? Um, Clevin. Clevin, uh, who hasn't played a lot of games yet, but he's there. Mm-hmm. And so then on the right side, you've got Zub, Bernard Docker, Hamannick. Like the right side needs to be fixed. You can't, and yeah, Chikrin was supposed to fix that. He was supposed to be a lefty who could play on the offside, which is totally a thing that is, you know, that's fine if that works. It doesn't right now. And I looked at the top teams, who they have on their defensive pairings. Like, what are the top teams sporting with their defensive pairings? All of them have two lefties and two righties on their top two pairings. Without fail, I checked a bunch of them, uh, eight or nine teams, all of them have that at the top of the standing. They don't load up on one side and just kind of fudge in the others. That's Unless why, they're Toronto. Well, yeah, but they've got other issues. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I so I agree. We Ottawa needs uh, needs some help on the right side. They need a natural right hand shot. And they're they're a rare commodity in the NHL. There are a lot of teams that want a right hand shot, and uh, uh, they're always going to be outnumbered by left hand shots um, at the moment. Yeah, yeah. Um, May I present to you one, Eric Carlson? Oof. I think that would be a mistake. <laughs> That's a rabbit hole we're going to go down another day. Uh, yeah. I just wanted to throw that in there because it, yeah. it fit the conversation well. Continue on, Paul. Sorry. Yeah, no, I was just that was the the only point. They they're they're just not making a lot of right hand shots, and there are a whole variety of reasons for that. There's a whole bunch of competition for it. Um, even though a guy like Chikrin, sure, he's a left hand shot that ostensibly can play right, but he's never going to be. You know, the, you're so disadvantaged trying to play on your off uh, on your off side. You just can't make up for it. Uh, not in the NHL anyway. So. I don't know. I agree. Um, Shabbat, you can't move. Sanderson, you don't want to move. Plenty of lefties coming up. Uh, well, there's too many left-hand shots now. And more coming up through through the farm system. You, you know, you mentioned Clevin. There's Larson. Uh, uh, Jordan Donovan, right? Uh, the Czech kids. Uh, Amara. His name? Yeah, Amara. Amara. Donovan Sabrango. I mean, most of these guys probably aren't going to be NHLers, but they're still in the pipeline. You're still pretty deep on the left side. Um, yeah. yeah. 
you know, you, you've got, so the question would be, I mean, in that article I wrote and, you know, I took a cue from uh, you, Jacob, on this one was uh, what can you get for him? Well, an interesting trade, maybe uh, Olmark, the Boston goalie, uh, that could be a one for one trade. They both make kind of the same salaries and, and, you know, in this league, you 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 pretty much got to make one to one trades right because it, the the salary cap is so tight but uh i don't know boston could probably get more for allmark than 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 chicken right the way things are now with chicken the way he's been performing yeah that'd be an interesting deal to see how boston would value chicken right cuz they already have charlie McAvoy on the left side um, and they have a lot of those like tough defensive shot blocking machines. Um, they have a good defense group. Chikrin could fit in there pretty well. I Yeah, I like that. Yeah, so yep, so I'm on board with uh, selling Chikrin now. <laughs> You've convinced me. Well, and I don't know what side I'm on. I, I'm on the side of I just trust Steve Steos to do what's best for this team. <laughs> Nothing else you can really do. I do like some of the moves that he's made recently. Uh, acquiring Jamison Reese for a sixth round pick. I'm a huge fan of that. That's like one of the best bets you can take right now. Um, if Ottawa traded even a third or a fourth for him, I would still be very happy about it. I'm big on Jamison Reese, just as a little bit of a side note. Um, and then acquiring um, Wyatt Bon Giovanni. I don't, I don't mind that either. Good AHL depth. Uh, so I, I like. I trust where uh, Steve Steos' mind is at. And he's he's out there looking for out of the box trades. Like you'd never see Pierre Dorian acquire Jamison Reese at the AHL trade deadline. Never anything like that. Or even like acquiring Bon Giovanni, even though he is just an AHL depth player and it was future considerations. Pierre Dorian never made a trade like that. Or hardly ever. He had to with um Michael McNiven last year just because Ottawa ran out of goalies. But like you don't see trades like that. Um, so we're going to switch gears a little bit to the last 14 games, 14, 15 games of the season. Um, and just to wrap things up here, what do you want to see? Do you want to see, would you rather see 15 and 0 or 0 and 15 go for the Macklin Celebrini pick or develop that winning culture? Like we've talked about in the past Dayton. Um, well, you said develop that winning culture. Like we have seen in the past. Sorry, um, like we've talked about in the past is what I meant, but yeah. yeah. Yeah, they they're really good at finishing strong and then not starting out strong again. So they're not developing a winning culture despite doing that. Right? So I would like to see maybe not 0 and 15, but I'd like to see let me re- put it in a, a fancier way. I want to see the young guys get chances. Mm-hmm. I want to see AHL players who haven't had a chance in the NHL yet get that shot. If Norris is on the LTIR, that gives cap relief to start moving some guys around. You can bring up some guys and you don't have to immediately put them down. (laughs) Maybe not the best turn of phrase. (laughs) Um, You don't have to send them down immediately once the, the guy comes back. You have some freedom here. So bring back Clevin. Let's see what he's got. Um, Let's get some more games for Maxence Gwinnett. Some of those, his appearances haven't looked good, but maybe try him in some different positions. Or not position, like uh, places on the on the depth chart, right? We don't need to pull another uh, Brandstrom here. Uh, bring up Jameson Reese. See how he does. It, this is a fantastic time to start evaluating what you have. And yes, that's going to result in a lot of losses. But I don't think winning matters right now. Evaluation and figuring out where this team is going and what they need. Um, I think a guy that I want to see more of is Lassie Thompson. What is he right now? Is he sticking around? Jacob Larson. There's another guy that needs to get a bit more of a look. Is he just going to be an AHL guy? Does he have some NHL potential? This is the time to do that. And so that's that's what I want to see with the Senators is to start trying these out-of-the-box thinking like Steos has shown already, bringing up these guys, giving them the opportunities, and like, sure, put them on the first line. Put them on the second pairing. Give them an opportunity to succeed. 
And if it doesn't work, move it around. Don't have anything set in stone for this last little bit. I 100% agree on the premise of that. And I think that Zach Ostopchuk has looked absolutely fantastic in Ottawa. Uh, I I love his game. I've been a huge fan of him since he was with the Vancouver Giants. Um, and he, he's fit in really well in Ottawa. My counterpoint to the points that you've made, why not evaluate them on a playoff push in Belleville? That's like, would you rather them see failure at the NHL level or success at the AHL level? Ooh. <laughs> Do they that's, have why, a that's why they, that, well, that's why they acquired Jamison Reese and why Giovanni is to add more depth to that team because they are pushing for the playoffs and they're looking to go on a run. Yeah. Um, so, and I, I was actually surprised to stop Chuck is up in the NHL um, just because of that, because they are pushing for the playoffs and, Hoping to go on a run there. Well, you know, you would also be good. Yeah. I mean, you raise a good point there, Jacob. I mean, where are they going to get more benefit from, uh, you know, real live hardcore playoff action in the AHL where games are mean something or what is it? 14 meaningless games on what is this death march uh, to the end of the season, you know? And that being said, I am completely changing my perspective on this. And I am all about Macklin Celebrini right now or whoever Ottawa ends up with. Um, They are two points ahead of Columbus for fourth last in the NHL. Columbus is Ottawa. Columbus is in fourth last right now, two points behind Ottawa. (laughs) Well, you know, and, and as, as we all pointed out last week, uh, no one, uh, no player certainly would or coach would deliberately throw games to uh, to improve their standing in the draft. But uh, general managers do, and I'm not suggesting they're throwing it. But you know, there's an argument uh, you can make that Steos and and Dayton did it right. Steos needs to uh, see what he's got in in uh, in Belleville. Uh, he's got to look forward to building next year's roster and it's perfectly legitimate for him to bring up AHL players. And of course, we all know that when you do that, you're not likely to win many games in, in the NHL. Uh, yeah. I'm not saying that would be his primary objective in doing that, improving his position in the draft, but it is a consequence of it. And uh, I don't think he can be faulted for it. Uh, no, I mean, Mike Greer just did it for 82 games. <laughs> <laughs> but you know the problem with and we've had this discussion before you know they should spend the rest of the season you know trying to regain uh, some of their shredded pride and and Claude Giroux was saying you know we got to use these games to uh you know find our identity but you know the problem with, come on Claude you're not going to find your identity in 15 games if you don't have an identity now you're not going to get it in 15 games yeah, we're too far gone now. The season, the season's gone. With the when there was thirty games left, I was all about, I was all with Claude Giroux on that. But now that it, like it's done, done. Yeah, and and you know, reclaiming your pride. I mean, there's there's no pride left here, man. It's terrible. Yeah, nobody looks happy on the Senators bench. Brady Kachuk got kicked out at the end of the game for just yelling at everybody on the Bruins bench. Um, Tim Stutzel was on the bench and the camera cut to him and there was a lot of profanities coming out of his mouth. Then it cut over to Claude Giroux and he looked absolutely miserable. Like this team, something's got to change. I don't, I don't know what it is. That's going to wrap things up for this week. Um, didn't really stick to a specific topic. We were all over the place. So um, if you followed all of that, thank you. And if you enjoy this episode, let us know in the comments down below. Um, check out our content. Uh, the links to all of our pages are down in the description. Hope you enjoyed and we'll see you next week.